Where are you from? This is now on. Edison, New Jersey. Exit 10. Is No, not really. Really, no. It's really, I keep thinking people from New Jersey or Connecticut don't come here all the time. It's like people from all over. It's a definite. I mean, I would come into uh, the village a couple of times. I really never came in. Let me ask you something. This is something I was just asking Richie as well. How do you think it's possible for the band to maintain the kind of ties with the fans that you prided yourself? Well, it depends on the situation. If there's 600 people there, we can't say hello to 600 people. But if there's four people there, we could say hello to four people. But I don't even mean that. I don't even mean like signing autographs or saying hello. I mean just being in touch, knowing what it is that they want to hear, and I don't mean being a pizza parlor, yeah. really. You know, I'm just saying like knowing. You know what happens sometimes when you get really famous and you get insulated from the world because you have to go through kitchens and can't hang out That's right. like that? Um, that's a tough one. I guess just being streetwise because we were from the street for we were from the street for so long, yeah. so we know about it. And uh, just the experiences of playing. I mean, you got to remember that. Just to look when you're up on stage and look into somebody's eyes, you know if things work and if they don't work, and you sort of know what they want and what they don't want. Do you think there gets to be a point where they'll just take anything you give them and they don't know the difference just because they've been told by their friends this is the number one album? This Band, they're great. They get into the band, they like the band, then it becomes so big. Then you can't get tickets to your shows anymore. And by the very nature of that, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like they just would love anything you do. Well, there's still, I mean, I guess you can, the, the cool thing about the Beatles, what they did was they took their fans somewhere. You know, one record came out and it was like two songs of the same, of the last step, and then they went somewhere else, mm -hmm. which was always a neat thing. Is that what you're going to tell? Well, we got to grow, and we have to move somewhere. We're not going to all of a sudden become a disco punk band or something like that. You know, it's it's not like us to do that. But we're definitely going to going to move and grow, because this was really the first album where we had fun. Last year was was you hell. Mean, you mean the first tour where you had fun? No, that? just actually making the record. That's why this all came together, because the last record was tough with producers and it just wasn't any fun. And this record, Bruce Fairburn was great. And he just went, you know, have a ball. And there was no hired musicians or anything, and we just came in and, and knocked it off. And he believed in us, which is a little different. The last producer was like, go ahead, be good, I dare you. Lance Quinn. And it wasn't his fault because he was doing too many projects, and he was just nuts. And it was in between your first and your second record. You can't have any breaks. You have to work real hard and get right into it. And this one, the stage was set. We just went in. We went into writing and just just worked and worked and worked and waited until it was ready. And played the entire world and set up that foundation and then this year it just came all together. And it's really the tip of the iceberg. The next year it's just going to continue on. In terms of being challenged and moving on and taking the audience with you, is that something you feel really strongly about? I mean, do, you, do you get pissed off about people thinking or maybe some of the press I know, and the cool thing is you can tell exactly when they leave, because they'll comment about the last song and then they're out of there. The last song? Well, their last song. Oh, oh, oh. They'll like say something about never say goodbye, and that's the end of the piece. You go, I know they split right after that, because they listen to Beethoven and all that kind of stuff. No, Beethoven, I don't know what they listen to Elvis Costello, I think. They have no clue. But anyway, I mean, does it bother you, that kind of stuff? I mean, as a musician, do you feel that you're not appreciated properly? No, not at all, because I don't, I don't take those things in vain at all. I look at the kids, and we play, and if there's 19,000 kids loving you and going sick and putting their hands up mm -hmm. and just, just loving what you're doing and you're loving doing what you are doing, then this person's not going to ruin my day. Okay. If you got a good review... Worry, or would it please your ego? Uh, I've read good and bad, and I guess we're somewhere in the middle. That's all I can say about that. Yeah. Um, when you dreamt of whatever you wanted to happen to you, you would get in your face. I mean, like, as far as you could see. Playing Madison Square Garden, playing Giant Stadium, having number one album, single what? 
or less than that, playing Great Adventures. You know what I mean? Like what? Well, a neat thing was uh, a lot of my friends went to the show in the garden and also at the Meadowlands. And one of my good friends who I was in the first band with, we used to go to concerts all the time. And I used to always say, I wish I was sitting down there looking up. Now I am. I mean, it's, it's the best thing. It, sitting down where? You mean you wish you were there? I wish I was on stage. On I stage. mean, saying sitting up in the audience. Well, you were up oh, yeah. In the audience. See, I'm always thinking of people sitting down. So no, I never had floor <laughs> seats. I always yeah. had like the back seats. And the first concert I ever went to was Kiss. Which one? 1976. Can I was. You just Oh, 19, Please start again, the first concert. The first concert I ever went to was Kiss at the Garden. I don't want you to have to lean forward. Lean where you feel comfortable and just stick that. Go ahead. Okay. Kiss in 1976. I guess I was 13. Right? 75, 76. How old are you now? 25. I think it was then, because I still had the program from home. I was in the last two seats in the garden. And just saying, I mean, I'd, I would love to be on that stage playing. And you, was, and you were playing then? I yeah, mean, you were I've been playing since I'm seven. Really? Did you have lessons and all that? I mean, you were classically, classically trained and yeah, all that? Classically, yeah, at seven. Did you play anything? I mean, Rachmaninoff, Beethoven, all that, so you can Chopin. all that stuff? Yeah. Oh, how great. Do you ever? Yeah, all the time. I, I always practice before the shows. I'm playing really? for a couple hours, yeah, because I don't want to lose the chops. And did you also play in some like Holiday Inn Lounge thing? Feelings, or I did everything. No, I did everything. That's I played. Amazing. I played. What kind of life is that like for people? Like an old guy doing that. What is that like? It's actually an enjoyable thing because the one thing that that music gives you or playing an instrument that nobody else has is you can sit there and make music, and it's one of the most enjoying things in the world. It, it's you just sit down and there's you're only as good. As you as you practice, it doesn't lie. It's the most honest thing on earth. I mean, there's 88 keys in front of me. Well, wait a minute. What about your talent? Well, what there's practice. Saying? I mean, there's talent, but then you have to bring that talent somewhere. Yeah. You have to practice and practice and practice, and that's the coolest thing about it is that 88 keys is still there, and it's been there for 300 years, and the only thing that changes is you. So that person playing in there is enjoying himself. I I went to this place, uh, Jake's in Asbury Park, and there was this old guy playing, and he was great and just loving it. See, that's the cool thing about music. It's not, maybe their, their life isn't grandeur and great and everything, but at least they're enjoying themselves. You think? They're not depressed. They don't have dreams of something greater, and they just, like, have to go schlep there every night and play feelings for people who are drunk and picking feelings. up. No, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. For some, I guess it depends what, what you want it for. If you wanted to get into it to be a rock star and be, be in a huge band and everything, then I guess it's not your dream. It's not. How did you feel though? I made 40 bucks for three hours. I thought it was pretty cool. Really? And it was just, it was one of the best lessons because you just kept playing and everybody would come up to you and say, you know, not so loud. It's just background music, you know, and you play all this. What was the most adventurous you ever got in any of those places? What was like the most wild thing you ever played? Like, did you ever one night just go crazy and start playing tutti frutti? And oh, yeah. Laugh? Just to piss everybody off. Really? My last days, I really? would always, yeah, just play boogie woogie rock and roll. Uh -huh. Great balls of fire and all that kind of fun stuff. And they actually liked it. Really? Yeah. Was it like a lot of drunken salesmen and conventioneers and things like that? Right? No, the places I played was more dinner places. I was dinner background music. What did you wear? Uh, I had to wear a tie and suit. I hated it. How old were you? I first started when I was... I guess I was doing those gigs around from 17 to 20. Still playing rock and roll, but like on nights off I would go to to small restaurants Were and just make some school? money. I was in school, yeah. So this was like after? Yeah. Friday, Saturday night if we weren't playing. Just to make some extra bucks. Ninotchkas in Perth Amway used to play in the window. Yeah. Window? Yeah. What do you mean the window? What? They had like a little window bay with a, with a piano in there and they used to have to play like Happy Birthday and all that. What was your hair like? stuff. Uh, short, a little shorter, <laughs> curly. So I was wait. more conservative. It's so, all right, so we'll back up a second. So you were doing all this stuff, and you were dreaming of one day being on the stage of Asimov. How did you think you'd get there? Well, Johnny and I teamed up in, when we were 16, and the first band I was in was when I was 13. But did you think you'd do it with him? Yeah, I always believed in him. Really? Why? Did you just think he was a star? Did you just think he was driven? What did you think? Um, I just think he was driven. 
and he was he just had that that look in his eye he was just driven and we used to play f five nights a week come home from high school at f seven in the morning have to get up or five in the morning have to get up at seven for school and I would do it and I had the van I used to drive the van with all my keyboards load everything in I'd be the first guy there and the, f and the, the last guy to leave but I believed in it I believe in the project so much and John and just stuck with it and then he went his way to do some original stuff and I studied piano for Juilliard I wanted to go to that school for a while that was one of my dreams I said okay I'll give up the rock and roll stuff and I'll just try to be a serious piano player and what would that mean what would that entail where, where can you go with that I mean Carnegie Hall the subtle yeah and at that point I was practicing eight to fourteen hours a day for I put in two years just for the Actually, or just the no just uh, just on my own for the audition and and uh, right before, there was a couple of months after the auditions, and Johnny and I went out to California, and we supposedly got this record deal. So I blew off the old, uh, the clean living life and said, I want to play rock and roll and have fun. So wait a minute, so you never took the audition? I took the audition, but, it? yeah. So but I didn't go to the school, yeah, but I didn't go to the school. You regret that? No, not at all. When you say clean living, you rejected the clean living life. Well, what the, does that mean? I, I guess, well, to be a classical pianist, first of all, I've been playing for, at that point, 15 years. And, you know, I wouldn't have made it for another 15 years of serious practicing. Really? Yeah. It's really worth it? It's serious. But aren't those people all sick? I mean, isn't that life in its own way just berserk? It's berserk. You know, it's totally I mean, berserk. Like ballet dancers are the craziest people I know. They're really a bunch of nutcases. It's, it's and totally things. dedicated to your art. You're nuts. Yeah. Well, I've been playing since I'm seven, and at that point, I said to myself, I still have to practice here for like 7,000 hours for a 10-minute audition. But I'm a driven person. When I want something, really? I get it. And I did it. I mean, I stopped everything I was doing, and I just sat at the piano for... How'd your family feel about this choice? They've been very supportive, always. Always? always. They wouldn't have preferred you going to Juilliard? Whatever I wanted to do... Because I was always, I mean, to put in 14 hours a day for two years. You come from a wealthy family? Middle class. So you were comfortable. There wasn't yeah. really a struggle involved. No. And um, so were you spoiled, do you think? Did you know what Semi, you yeah, a little Jewish. Uh, no, uh, well, I had a good life. That, no, that. we're not using that. No, no, it's all right. I, I let them know. Go ahead. Um, not spoiled, but, but my father, was a, he was a trumpet player. So he always pushed me. He actually played with Hot Lips Page. Really? Yeah. In the 40s, I guess that was, when he was like 18. So does he have great stories? Yeah, he's got some pretty neat stuff. He started me on trumpet when I was five. Mm -hmm. I still can what pick it up and play. play? Uh, I played violin for a while, bass violin, anything I can grab. Um, I could. So you're really musical. I mean, this is... You didn't have to stagger into this thing. No. no didn't stagger into it but I mean this situation was when when we said we were going out and we fir we did the first record we were only together for a couple months because John and I put together eight million thousand bands we had tons of people in the band we were John Bon Jovi and the Wild Ones I think we were the Letchers for I was a Wild One I was a Letcher I was everything and the first it was person was John Bon Jovi and yeah except for like the first band was Atlantic City Expressway but then it got to the point, he did a, a thing with the rest, and then he went his way. And then we tried to put together a band. And this, this formation, we were together a couple months, and then we did the first record. And Doc just sent us out you know, to work and work and work and work. Were you making money at first? Like how much? Like nothing. Like $25 a night? What, when we were first starting in this band? Yeah. Uh, we weren't making it by the night. I think we got a we got a salary that was recoupable. We had to pay it back. So it was nothing. I mean, when I first started playing in the well, bands, they they booked our first tours. Yeah, but we played. First, we started in clubs. I, our first club tour, we did 28 dates in 30 days, and the two days we had off was from Toronto to Denver in a bus. Thanks. You know, I came home 150. I was almost dead. And then we went right on tour with the Scorpions. And we didn't make any money with them. We just went out. And we, it was the best lesson. The money wasn't, we weren't there for that. 
We were there to learn how to be a touring rock and roll band. Uh, five, six months. And then what? When, uh, F38 Specials right after that? No, no, this was the first year. So this is now the third of the touring, right? Or the fourth? I can't third. Yeah. Of course, we did a major tour with the Scorps, then we did last year the major thing with Rat, and then this year, right before this tour, we did 38, 38 Special. 38 Special. But when you think about it, okay, it's four years, but a lot of bands... A lot of bands do years and years and years. Were you prepared to do a lot longer? You had to? Now, if this album hadn't hit the way it did. Just go on. What would have happened? Keep playing no. and, and come up with the next one. Now That's the one thing about music is it's such a fic fickle business. You don't know if you're ever going to make it. There's no guarantees. There's no anything. And some people, like you said, that, that person may be playing that, that club when he's an older person didn't get his dream. But if you just try hard, sometimes it comes true. I mean, I'm, I'm the luckiest kid on earth. I worked hard, maybe just as hard as anybody else did, but we got it. Now that you got it, now what? Now's the time to work. Now you scared? Not at all. Maybe you'll lose it. Not at all. No. Well, maybe not scared, but inspired to work more and not sit on your heels and go, okay, we made it, so that's it. Just keep churning out the same thing. Right. Now it's, it's time to be creative, see, see why it went there, what happened, and then move on. But sometimes you can't really figure those things out, can you? I mean, you can't figure out how nobody says Nobody says you're right, but you, step, you have to have some kind of definition well, in your head. <sighs> Timing and a foundation and good songs and good, good material. We had the foundation. We were ready. We were definitely ready because we opened up for everybody, and we, we played the entire world, which some bands don't do. They'll play the United States. We played everywhere. And we were actually bigger in Europe than in America because we just went over there and played and played and played and played. So we were, we can play live. We can back our, a lot of bands can't back their material up, but we could. So when we went into the studio, this was more of a live record. There's no tons of overdubbing, there's nothing. And the timing was, was great because nobody was out. Nobody was out when we came out. It was perfect timing. Van Halen had just split up which left, there was just gaps and openings for us, and the timing was right. And they were good, real good songs, and the record is good. I genuinely like it. Do you still feel that there's a ton of musical stuff that you have yet to unleash on people? Tons. Like that's, that's, like, that's a neat part with, with Richie and I, the way we work, is we, have, we make the music behind the lyrics and everything else. There's guitar and uh, there's drums and, and the bass to keep that happening. But we can go on and do different kind of stuff. I can play piano parts or organ parts or synths. And it's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg for that. What about the writing? Now, are they mostly just writing themselves? John and um, I mean, how do you feel about I got one song on a, a B-side in England called uh, Borderline. And this year, I, I didn't, last year I wrote the first single. And this year, I, we wrote a, a ton of songs, but mine didn't make it to the record. Is that a problem? Not really. It's not? No, because whatever is good for the record makes it. Who decides? You know. Really? You just know. I remember talking with the police. Well, you know, we brought these songs in, but um, you know, then there's a message in a bottle of Roxanne, what are you going to say? Yeah, that's it. And plus all the, for me, this year maybe I didn't write a lot of songs, but I still wrote all my parts, which mm -hmm. is which is a hook, and to me that is a song, because it's still music. Um, you don't foresee any problems in terms of songwriting credits and publishing and all of that kind of stuff. You're not into that. No, I mean that that doesn't bother me. I write. I have a ton of ideas, and I bring them to John, and I say, here's these ideas. Let's work on them. And he's, he's willing to work. Is it very acknowledged, really, that John is sort of the leader of this band? Yeah. Do you think that bothers anybody? We look at it egos as... Egos being as they are. Egos being as they are. We look at it as, as sort of a football team. And the quarterback has the ball, right? And he can't win if nobody's blocking for him or if he has nobody to throw it to. But he's still the quarterback. Mm -hmm. And he listens to his team because it's... It's a team that wins, and that's the one thing with us is it's a team. And he's got great ideas. He is the quarterback. He holds the ball. And I can't say to myself, well, 
I'm not the quarterback, but I'm going to I'm not going to kill myself trying to be because I'm not. That's not my gig. Mm -hmm. I'm happy being you know the the blocker, being part of the team. I'm a team player. Which works. I mean, it definitely works. He's we we take pictures as a band, we talk as a band, and it's just more there's more facets for kids. But are you talking lately more as a band than you used to? When it first starts out, there's a focal point. There's always the lead singer's focal point. And thank God we got a star. I mean, there's a lot of bands who don't have their lead singer isn't a star. Who? I mean, I'm not going to, you know, even... Yeah. But he's... Anyway. Um, do you want to make any other kind of album that you feel you can't make within Bon Jovi that you would ever want to do on your own someday? It hasn't been a topic on my mind that's that's very strong at this point I want to keep going with this project heavily but um not really like movies I guess or something like that because I'm still soundtracks, soundtracks uh -huh. because I, I like to play with emotions that's the one thing with piano is you can create emotions uh -huh. and keyboards you know you have strings you have voices you have everything at your hands which is what I did on this record like for living on a prayer that intro I came up with which wasn't even part of the song, but it created so much tension mm -hmm. that it was right, and we put it on. I like to do that, you know, get that kind of, you're just waiting for it to let go, and then it lets go, and you're, ah, and here's the song. What's your life like now? Where do you live? Now I live in, uh, in a box. I'm out on the street. I moved out of my apartment, and I'm waiting to get into my house. <laughs> but, I'm, uh, but I'm not in the house yet, uh -huh. because it's not going to close until I'm after until after we're out of the country. Right. So I'm living in Tigo's basement right now. I see. Do you live by yourself? Uh, sort of. What does that mean? I don't... You don't want to talk about no. it? No. Um, all right, so scratch that. Do you feel that when the band got really successful that it wrecked havoc with your personal life? Did it change a lot of your relationships and cause problems with people that were in your life that weren't ready to... Not, not really. When you're being away or something. Not really, because we've been away. Well, okay. How about when you first had to start going away? Well, when I first started going away in '83, I mean, you just lost. We just went on the road, and we were gone. And you lost everything. Well, you didn't. Friends, the relationships. Everything. Friends. Yeah. And you just went out and just, you know, we. This is our family. And now when we come back, like people say, well, now you're successful. We haven't been home. I come home on a couple of days, like in between the shows, and uh, it's pretty neat, you know. Now you get recognized at home, and you're, I'm pretty, I'm tickled about it. You like that? Yeah, I think it's pretty it neat. It doesn't hassle you. You feel a loss of privacy or something like that. No, not that bad. Not at all. I mean, for John, it's a little tougher. But for me, it's not that bad. Well, you could probably just put the hair. If side. you just hide your hair up. How do you the, hide that hair? <laughs> I'll never tell. I mean, that's really a whole number, isn't it? Yeah. Yet. Stuff the hair up under something. But you just hide that and you can you can live normal. But has your life changed? I mean, you don't even really know yet because you've just been on this road for so long. We've been on the road. I don't you even know. Are addicted to being on the road? You think you're going to get home and you're going to be bored? I'm not going to know how to live. Exactly. I mean, you're really going to like freak out and be too bright? Well, something? the first year we had four days off. Oh, come on. We came home. We, had, we took four days and we started writing right after that. But that's every day hitting at it every day yeah. and then going right into the studio and then the next year we had 10 days off so I said it's it's only getting better than for days off and we're right out on the road so I really don't know what it is to be home looking forward to it or not? I'm looking forward to just resting I mean that that's gonna be a, a cool thing we're gonna go around tired. the world now I'm tired exhausted totally not tired. exhausted I mean you're about to go to Australia and Japan How can you I'm not exhausted, I'm tired. Mm. You can sleep on the plane. <laughs> I could sleep on the plane. And plus it's the... It's a 14-hour trip. The air, it's hard playing at home. That's the big thing. We finish off at home. And it's so hard because you have relatives, relatives tickets. It's and like an Italian it's, wedding. <laughs> it's like an Italian wedding because you're on stage and you're not... I'd rather play Biloxi because there's, you can do what you do. But I'm thinking on stage, I'm playing, I'm going, okay, is my mother in? Is this person in? If they don't get in, she's going to kill me. This person's going to kill me. Did I get this right? Did I got limos coming here? It's just, it just drains you. It definitely drains you. And you had six of them, didn't you? Yeah. Now, did they come to all of them? 
But Is most she of like them. Everywhere, Nassau, the Middle East, and the Garden. A lot. So it's just they draining. Buy tickets yeah, tickets. tickets and passes. And how you can't? How are you going to say no to your uncle? No, no. And you're people in. People that you never heard of also all of a sudden start to have new parents, friends, and yeah. It's crazy. What's the worst thing about all this for you? I don't think there's anything too bad. Small hotel rooms is uh, I pisses me off. There are other things you hate in hotels, like when the phone's not next to the bed. Or no, that doesn't. Or it doesn't. Little things like that. Doesn't bother me. No. Well, how small are the rooms you're in? I'm just kidding with you. Uh, we have nice stuff. You must be in better hotels now than when you yeah. started out. No right? days in anymore. Did you ever used to share rooms now? <sighs> you did? Are you kidding? Our first tour that well, we did. How did you do that with five of you? We slept in the bed on the floor. What do you mean? Not five in a room. And five in a room. No. 16 bucks. Where? The days in. Where? We did our first D -A -Z thing for. D A Y S. D A Y S. The days in. We oh, did. We opened up for uh, Eddie Money. That was our first thing we ever did as a band in a station wagon, and Richie Bozet, our tour manager, was driving. You drove That's what we did. We have we put our equipment on his truck. We had the band, and one roadie. This was premier book. This. This was premier book. This. It was two guys in the front, three in the back, and Tico and Al were in the back. Al wasn't even playing. He had a wedding, so we had to get a, a fill-in bass player to do it. His sister got married, so he couldn't play the first couple of gigs. So they were having their feet hang out at the back of the station wagon. We would have to get to the gig, set up, because we only had one roadie. And when it was done, drive to the next place. Richie and I would be driving, and we would stay in days in, take a shower. Five of us in one room, 16 bucks, that's all we could afford. We started off where you're supposed to start off, on the bottom. And so when you get, I think it's been good, though, because when we get to this point, I mean, now we're staying in nice hotels, but... I remember those days in, and I remember all that struggle, and I, I say, thank God. I look at it, you know, as a very humbling factor. Instead of taking all this stuff in for granted, I'm a thankful person for it and feel lucky. I mean, you got the talent and you have the work, but there's still only so many bands that make it. Are there any people that you're sort of in awe of or starstruck by? I mean, you know, John seems so, like you mentioned, some people's name, and his whole face lights up and gets like really carried away with the detail of anybody. John Lord was always a cool person. Yeah. yeah. He was the reason why I saw, well, I got the record, Deep Purple, live in Japan. I went out and bought an organ because this guy was the coolest on earth. And in one of the polls in England, there was a, a big thing where in Kerrang, in the history of Kerrang, he was always number one, and I beat him out this year. And I was like, wow, man, that's wild. You beat out your heroes. Did you meet him? Yeah, I met him at the, at the Meadowlands, and I was, couldn't even talk. I was just like awed, which is, it's pretty wild. I guess you you don't know what to feel because you're just a person. I mean, I'm just a person. I play what I play, and when people look up to you and they go nuts, it's sort of weird. It's a weird kind of feeling. I don't know what to feel. I just go, oh, how you doing? I mean, somebody tell you that you've changed your life. I know, and it's it's a weird kind. Of, it makes you think that you got to be responsible. I guess in in not trying to ruin somebody's life. <laughs> You ruined my life. Hey, thanks. Have you always been pretty sensible? Pretty much. And intelligent and not insane and screwed up or any of that? Or have you had like real bad periods or no. troubled times or problems with drugs or any of that? No, reform school when I was seven, you know, just busting serious. up those uh, bricks. That was about it. Chain gangs. No, I mean, not at all. You do have quite a sense of humor, don't you? I mean, you're constantly joking. You've been very serious throughout this, but generally. Sort of a yeah, no? I love comedians. I, I watch every one of them. Eddie Murphy is the best, uh -huh. and uh, Richard Pryor. I have every one of his records that he ever put out. Yeah. I mean, nobody has his records. I have his records. Uh -huh. Steve Martin. I have Steve Martin's first record, which came with a picture with a fish inside his suit. I still have that thing. The Jerk was my like favorite movie on earth. Uh -huh. I saw it sixteen times. I but loved it. But you're constantly like quoting and cracking up, and it, you keep them laughing all the time. Oh, definitely. I mean, that's very much like, does it alleviate a lot of the tension sometimes? Always yeah. pop in a joke, and it, and it alleviates a lot. Is that natural for you to do? I mean, it's just you. Yeah, I just look at life funny. It's, it's, it's a lot better. Is it covering up for something else sort of darker and deeper? And no. I figure it this way. You've got to go through every day anyway. And you can look at it two ways, good or bad. 
So you might as well look at it good because it's going to be there. The next day is going to be there no matter, you're going to wake up, hopefully. <laughs> I guess there's some days where you don't, and then that's another story. But you're going to wake up and you got to deal with the day. So you might as well deal with it in a good, positive attitude and just be, just mock it out. You easy to get along with? Yeah, pretty much. I, saw, I mean, I'm human. If I'm pissed off or something, I mean, I, I, I get that way. But generally, I'm pretty even-keeled. <laughs>